Welcome back. Over the past two lectures, we've been looking at arched structures in ancient and medieval eras. Today, we want to look at the parallel development of domed structures during the same general span of time and then on into the Renaissance. The dome is actually a prehistoric structural element. There are domed mud brick buildings that have been uh, uncovered at archaeological sites in Mesopotamia dating back to 6000 BC. And of course, we've already seen the corbelled domes that were constructed at Mycenae around 1250 BC. But as with arches, domes really didn't come of age until the Roman era. From that point forward, their development was marked not by a gradual evolution over time, but by a few dramatic leaps in structural sophistication. Today we'll be focusing on three of those dramatic leaps. And all three occurred in iconic structures that really represent the very best in technological development of their respective eras. The Pantheon of Ancient Rome, the magnificent Byzantine-era Basilica of Hagia Sophia in modern Istanbul, and the Renaissance-era dome over the great cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, Italy. But before we address these specific structures, we need to talk about the dome as a structural element. And first, we really need to talk about some basic terminology. Now, when we look at internal forces within a dome, we're going to need to be able to refer to their principal directions. And we need some nomenclature to make reference to those directions. A dome looks a lot like half of a globe. So let's borrow some terminology from our colleagues in the geography department. What we want to do is superimpose a grid of latitude and longitude lines over a hemispherical dome. And just as the geographers do, we'll use the term meridian in reference to a line of longitude and parallel in reference to a line of latitude. Now we're ready to talk about how a dome actually works as a structural element. Here we have a model of a dome and I'm going to use this model to demonstrate how very different the behavior of a dome is with respect to those two principal directions. The direction of the meridians, which we'll call meridional, and the direction of the parallels, which we'll call the parallel direction. And again, the behavior is quite different in those two directions. The meridional direction is quite easy. In fact, in that direction, a dome behaves essentially like an arch. When it's subjected to its primary loading, that is the self-weight of the dome, the dome tends to flatten out, and those meridional slices behave just like arches in that they flatten, and they extend outward on the ends. They undergo lateral thrust in exactly the same way that arches undergo lateral thrust. So you can expect that containing that lateral thrust is going to be an important consideration in the analysis and design of domes. That's the meridional direction. But now in the parallel direction, we have a very different type of behavior. When I apply that same loading and those meridional slices flatten and spread out, notice that the gaps between the slices get considerably wider. They expand. In my model, that happens because the slices are, are physically separated from each other. But in an actual dome, that behavior would correspond to tension in the parallel direction. That is, tension around the circumference of the dome. That tension has a name. We call it hoop stress. It's a reference to the iron hoops that are used to hold a wooden barrel together. And it's really a wonderful term because it so beautifully describes the physical phenomenon of hoop stress. Like hoop stress, excuse me, like a hoop of a barrel, hoop stress in a dome can actually be a very good thing. In that, it allows the dome to carry load without any external lateral support. Now, this is the fundamental difference between domes and arches. Unlike an arch, a dome can carry load as a self-contained structural element, but it can only do it, it can only carry load without lateral support if it's able to resist that hoop stress. And since the hoop stress is tensile, that means that the material that the dome is made of has to be capable of carrying load in tension. So that's the good news. Hoop stress is helpful 
if the domes are made of the right material. The bad news is that ancient Byzantine and Renaissance era domes were all made of materials with little or no tensile strength. The Pantheon's made of concrete. The domes of Hagia Sophia and Santa Maria del Fiore are made of brick. Now, when a dome is made of a material with limited tensile strength, we really can't rely on hoop stress to keep it stable. So the dome has to have substantial external lateral support coming in from all directions as you see in this graphic. Let's see if we can't replicate this graphic on my physical model by adding that same sort of all-around lateral support to our dome. And to do that, I'm going to use a device called a tension ring, which we'll place over the top of the dome, and which has the effect of containing the base of the dome against that tendency to flatten out, the, the, the result of lateral thrust under load. You might think that this now solves our problem. It'll prevent the dome from expanding laterally. But it really doesn't solve the problem, because when I apply loading to the dome, you'll notice that the base no longer expands outward, but gaps still open up between the meridional slices. So what that tells us is that the tension ring has largely solved the problem of hoop stress at the base of the dome, but it hasn't solved the problem higher up, where we continue to see significant uh, hoop stress occurring at about one-third of the height of the dome. Resisting hoop stress is a significant challenge in any dome that's made of a material that has little or no tensile strength, like concrete or brick. And the designers of today's great structures met that challenge in a fundamentally different way in each of the three cases we'll be looking at. Let's start by considering the Pantheon. The Pantheon, a temple to all the gods, was built around 126 AD after a previous temple on that same site was destroyed by fire. It was probably designed by an accomplished Roman engineer named Apollodorus of Damascus, who's known to have designed several other monumental Roman structures that were built around the same era. When we look at the Pantheon from the front, it looks just like a traditional Greek-style temple. But beyond that portico is something very different. The main sanctuary of this temple is a circular plan with an inside diameter of 142 feet. And overhead is an extraordinary concrete dome of that same diameter at 142 feet. It was by far the largest dome of antiquity, but it was also the largest dome in the world all the way up to the 19th century. Now the structural system of the Pantheon consists of just two main elements, the dome itself, and then the cylindrical wall, which we call the drum, which supports the dome from below. That drum, the cylindrical wall, is 21 feet thick, and its interior face is punctuated first by the main entrance to the sanctuary, and then by seven large niches or indentations that are evenly spaced around the circumference of the interior wall. From a structural perspective, those niches are important to us because they represent places where the wall was much thinner than the normal 21-foot width of the remainder of the drum. Now, like Roman arches, the dome was constructed on temporary wooden centering, temporary shoring that held it up while construction was in process. And that centering was used to form the spherical shape of the dome, and it was also used to create those really interesting rectangular indentations on the inner surface of the sphere. Those are called coffers. And finally, the centering was used to form the most distinctive feature of the Pantheon, that circular opening at the very top of the dome called the oculus. Now, in general terms, here's how that structural system works. The weight of the dome, which is considerable, it's about 5,000 tons of concrete, is transmitted in compression from all the way up on top, the oculus, downward along those meridional lines to the base of the dome where it rests on the drum. And the drum then has to transmit the full weight of the dome plus its own self-weight straight downward into the building's foundations while also restraining that tendency of the dome to expand lateral, the horizontal thrust that we just saw in my demonstration. To make this system work, Apollodorus had to overcome three major challenges. First, he had to restrain that lateral thrust. Second, he had to design the dome such that it would it would be able to carry the hoop stresses that occur about a third of the way up from the base. 
And finally, he had to devise a way of transmitting all of that weight downward through the drum without crushing the niches, which are located at places around the perimeter of the drum where the walls are considerably thinner and therefore more vulnerable to overstress. Apollodorus handled that first challenge, containing the lateral thrust, first and foremost, by making the dome as light as possible. Now, as you can see in this cutaway drawing, the dome tapers significantly. It's 21 feet thick at its base, and it tapers down to only four feet thick at the top near the oculus. The oculus itself, as well as those coffers we looked at earlier, the rectangular indentations, further reduce the weight of the dome by replacing concrete with empty space. But perhaps the most innovative aspect of the dome design was Apollodorus's selective use of lightweight aggregate in the concrete. Now, as you'll recall from our lecture on engineering materials, aggregate is just the stone substance that's mixed with cement and water to create concrete. What Apollodorus did in the design of the dome was to vary the type of aggregate in order to better suit the structural purpose of the concrete at that specific location within the dome. The dome was constructed in layers of concrete, and at the lowest layers, all of the aggregate that was used to make the concrete is broken brick. It's very strong, but it's also relatively heavy. Higher up in the dome, the brick transitions to greater use of tufa. That's a porous limestone rock that's much lighter than brick. And then at the uppermost layers, close to the oculus, all of the aggregate in the concrete is an extremely lightweight volcanic pumice stone. Now, both tufa and pumice are nowhere near as strong as brick, but up near the top of the dome, strength really isn't as important as it is down at the base. And so Apollodorus was very carefully tailoring the material to its structural purpose. One uh, modern study of uh, the Dome of the Pantheon concluded that the use of lightweight aggregate alone reduced the stresses in the dome by over 40%. This sort of specialized use of lightweight aggregates which was common in Roman structures, wasn't used again until the 20th century in construction engineering technology. It's really quite amazing. The design of the drum also reflects Apollodorus' careful attention to the challenge of containing that lateral thrust delivered to the drum from the dome above. That circular configuration of the drum is inherently resistant to overturning, much more so than a column or a flat wall. The walls themselves are quite thick, and you'll note from the cutaway drawing that they extend upward well above the base of the dome in order to increase weight. As we've seen in previous lectures, both width and weight both increase the stability of a structure against overturning. Apollodorus handled the challenge of transmitting vertical load downward through the drum by using a device that we've also seen in previous lectures, the relieving arch. Here you see the relieving arches. If you look closely, you can see them on the surface of the outer walls of the drum of the Pantheon. What you can't see is that these relieving arches are located at the same locations as the niches are on the inside of the building. So these are the areas where the exterior walls are actually much thinner than 21 feet, and the relieving arches channel that tremendous weight of the dome safely around the niches and then directly down to the building foundations. And how did Apollodorus handle the hoop stress in the dome that occurs at a maximum of about one-third of the way up from the base? Well, what he did was to add extra weight to the lower portion of the dome all the way around the outer perimeter to prevent that bulging effect that we saw in my earlier demonstration. In this 3D model of the Pantheon, you can see that added weight of concrete in the form of those stepped rings that are provided around the outer circumference of the lower third of the dome. These provide the stabilizing function of closing up the gaps that you saw forming between those meridional segments in the demonstration that I did a little bit earlier. Now, before we leave the Pantheon, I've got to answer that question that's been on your mind for the past several minutes. How does the oculus work? And after all, if each meridian in a dome behaves just like an arch, then how can these arches be carrying load when their keystone is missing? Well, to understand the answer to this question, you need to look at the dome not as if it were a two-dimensional arch, but rather as a full three-dimensional structure. If you look closely on this model, 
you'll see that the outer perimeter of the oculus is reinforced with a ring of bricks called a compression ring. The compression ring is really fundamentally a three-dimensional keystone that just happens to be hollow in the middle. It's really a wonderful detail that reflects a keen understanding of the mechanics of a dome. Clearly, Apollodorus of Damascus knew what he was doing. Now, let's journey east to Constantinople, modern Istanbul, where we'll find Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, the world's finest example of Byzantine architecture. Hagia Sophia was constructed on order of the Emperor Justinian in 532 AD. When he consecrated the building seven years later, Justinian proclaimed, Solomon, I have outdone thee. Now, Byzantine emperors have never been known for their modesty, but in this case, Justinian might just have been right. After all, Hagia Sophia was not only the world's largest cathedral at the time it was opened, it was still the world's largest cathedral 1,000 years later. The heart of this structure is its central dome. At 102 feet in diameter, it's somewhat smaller than the dome of the Pantheon, but it's raised considerably higher above the floor. Amazingly, as you can see in this image, the dome is ringed by 40 windows placed around its circumference, precisely where the need for structural strength is the greatest. This unique feature was achieved by using these heavy meridional ribs that you can see running radially from the top of the dome all the way out to its base. These ribs carry the weight of the dome between the windows, and then they transmit that load out to a series of small buttresses, which transmit the load down into the structure below. Those buttresses are actually visible only from the exterior of the building, as you can see here. The greatest difference between Hagia Sophia and the Pantheon is the way the two domes are actually supported from below. The dome of the Pantheon is supported along its entire perimeter by a stout circular drum. The dome of Hagia Sophia rests on four massive stone columns arranged in a square, an arrangement that contributes to that sense of vast open space that we feel when we're inside the, uh, the basilica. But how can a heavy masonry dome stand on just four points of support? The designers of Hagia Sophia answered this question in a wonderfully elegant way with the invention of an architectural feature called the pendentive. Let's talk a little bit about how it works. What I'd like to do is build step-by-step step, that central module that's really at the heart of Hagia Sophia. We'll start with the four main piers, and on top of those four piers, we'll add four great arches, which define the perimeter of the square bay. The base of the dome now rests on the tops of these arches. But in this configuration, the dome is still supported only on four points, and we need to support it continuously all the way around its base. To do that, we have to fill in those four triangular spaces between the base of the dome and the four great arches. How do we do it? Well, the designers of Hagia Sophia found that they could superimpose a much larger hemisphere over the entire bay, as you see here, and then cut away everything except those four triangles, like this, and what's left, those four curved triangles, are in fact the pendentives. And now you know what they look like, we can go back to the interior of Hagia Sophia, and you can very clearly see them just below the dome, around the outer perimeter of that central square bay. Architecturally, the pendentives provide a beautiful smooth transition from the circular dome to the square bay below. Structurally, they provide the smooth flow of forces from the base of the dome down to those four great arches and ultimately to the four columns below the arches. The portion of the structural system that transmits all of the dome's weight down to the foundations is simply the module that you're looking at here. The dome, the pendentives, the great arches, and the four columns. If this structure stood alone, it would do just fine in carrying the weight of the dome downward. However, this structure alone is incapable of carrying the lateral thrust of the dome. Without the additional structural system that ultimately was built around this module, those four great arches would tip outward and topple over. So to examine how the full structural system resists the lateral thrust of the dome, we need to use this more complete structural model of the Hagia Sophia building, the complete structural system. At first glance, it looks confusing, I know. But if we just follow the load paths, one step at a time, 
I think you'll see that the system is both coherent and actually quite understandable. Now, this building actually has several major load paths corresponding to its major architectural axes. We're just going to look at the principal load path, which is oriented directly toward us in this particular view of the building. This axis of Hagia Sophia is defined by three main bays, the central square bay, which we just discussed, plus an additional semicircular bay on either side along that major axis. Each semicircular bay is covered by a semi-dome, that's a half dome located here, which provides lateral support to the central bay, and it also transmits that lateral thrust out, away from the main dome, and downward to a next level below. Beyond the semicircular bay is a pair of heavy columns, which support a very substantial buttress vault, which we see here. The buttress vault provides lateral support to the semi-dome, and it also transmits the lateral thrust another step outward and downward. If we now look diagonally out from the semi-dome, from that semicircular bay, you'll see two additional smaller semicircular chapels, each one covered by its own smaller semi-dome. These chapels provide additional lateral support in the diagonal directions. Again, we see this load fanning out from its initial point of application where the main dome meets the semi-domes. This lower arcade, all the way up at the front of the building, is yet another set of buttress vaults that transmit the load to these four heavy buttresses, which then effectively carry it all the way to ground level. At each step in this amazing load path, we see that the lateral thrust from the main dome spreads out progressively more widely at each step, reducing its intensity, at the same time being carried down lower and lower, closer to the ground where it ultimately can be transmitted into the foundations of the building. The focal point of this incredible system of semi-domes, vaults, and buttresses is the main dome itself. As originally constructed, it was actually quite flat. This diagram shows its profile, and note the rise is just 26 feet over a 102-foot span. Why, you might ask, was the dome so shallow? Well, actually, you could probably glean the answer from my earlier demonstration uh, on the subject of hoop stress in the dome. What we saw was that the maximum hoop stress in the dome occurred about one-third of the way up. What the designers of the dome at Hagia Sophia did was to simply eliminate the portion of the dome where the maximum hoop stresses occur by effectively slicing off the upper one-third of the dome and using it as a self-contained structural element. It's really quite an ingenious solution to the problem of resisting hoop stress in a masonry dome that really doesn't have the capacity to resist tensile stress. And in that respect, the original dome was actually quite effective. The problem is that a flat dome also generates even larger lateral thrust than hemispherical dome does. And this geometric configuration probably contributed to the original dome's collapse after a series of earthquakes rocked Constantinople in the 550s. The dome was rebuilt, but the reconstructed dome was made taller. It was doubled in height so that the configuration we see today is actually much closer to a hemisphere. That dome is significantly more stable because of its lower lateral thrust. Regardless of the dome's shape, though, the genius of Hagia Sophia is the integration of that dome into this elaborate structural system that clearly communicates its load paths while creating an interior space of incomparable grandeur. And speaking of grandeur, our third dome structure for today is the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence. This building was actually initially a product of the Gothic era. Construction began in 1296, but over time, that original Gothic concept was modified as the Florentines sought to distance themselves from the architectural styles that were made popular by the French and German enemies of Florence to the north. Here we see a kind of a hint that the Gothic era is beginning to give way to the Renaissance in Florence. The Renaissance, that great flowering of culture that resulted from the rediscovery of the art and architecture of classical Greece and Rome. In 1367, the Florentines voted to have the crossing of the nave and the transept of this cathedral covered by an immense octagonal dome. This is a really interesting case of democracy in action. We have a popular assembly being used to determine the configuration of a major architectural feature in the city. 
This dome at 135 feet across would be second in size only to the Pantheon. Of course, democracies are not always known for their good judgment. And though this popular assembly decided to create a dome, at that time, no one actually knew how such a dome might be built. And so the building sat, domeless, for 50 years while the cathedral wardens tried to figure out what to do. Well, in 1418, the wardens of the cathedral called a conference of experts to resolve once and for all the issue of how this dome would be built. A number of noted architects presented proposals at the conference, and one of them was a Florentine architect named Filippo Brunelleschi. As part of his proposal, Brunelleschi shocked the judges by proposing that he could build the dome without the use of any temporary centering to hold it up during construction. But he refused to explain how he would do it. As the author Giorgio Vasari tells the story, the skeptical judges demanded to know how Brunelleschi would build this dome. And in response, Brunelleschi only requested that an egg be brought into the assembly. He announced that anyone who could balance the egg on its end should be given the contract to build the dome. Everyone assembled tried and failed. And then Brunelleschi tried himself. He tapped the end of the egg to flatten it and then quite easily stood it on its, on its end. The observers cried foul, saying that they could have solved that problem if they had only known that they could flatten the end of the egg. And Brunelleschi replied that if he revealed his plan for building the dome, all of them would know how to do that as well. Having brilliantly secured his intellectual property rights, Brunelleschi won the contract. And from 1420 until his death in 1446, he built this great brick dome, finishing everything except the decorative stone lantern on top. Designing the dome, Brunelleschi faced four unique challenges. First, he had to build the dome on top of a 30-foot tall cupola, or tower, which made it particularly vulnerable to instability caused by the lateral thrust of the dome. Second, the dome would be octagonal in plan rather than circular, as all previous domes had been. Next, they would have that heavy stone lantern on top, an interesting structural challenge. But perhaps most importantly, the dome was situated 170 feet above the floor of the cathedral and had to be built without any temporary wooden centering at all, the system the Romans had used on the Pantheon. Brunelleschi's solutions to these problems were as ingenious as they were effective. First, he used a tall profile, seemingly Gothic in appearance. Recall that the flat dome at Hagia Sophia generated more thrust than a standard hemispherical dome. Brunelleschi's tall profile generated significantly less thrust and therefore was more stable under load and better capable of carrying that heavy stone lantern. Second, Brunelleschi used two thin shells rather than a single solid monolith. And he tied those two shells together with a grid of 24 ribs in the meridional direction and an additional nine horizontal or parallel ribs. The horizontal ribs were arched, as you can see here, so that they effectively formed a circular ring embedded inside those two octagonal shells. Through this configuration, Brunelleschi effectively overcame the problem of the octagonal shape by embedding a circular dome completely inside of the exterior octagonal shell. To counter the lateral thrust and the hoop stress, Brunelleschi took the extraordinary step of encircling the entire dome with four great chains, Three were made of stone and one was made of timber. One of these was all the way down at the base, but the others were elevated higher up, as far up as the top third of the dome, clearly demonstrating that Brunelleschi understood very clearly where the maximum hoop stress was likely to occur in this structural element. The chains would resist hoop stress with hoops, just like a barrel. Brunelleschi's stone chains, well, they don't actually look like chains. They actually look a lot more like railroad tracks, as you can see in this graphic. There's an interlocking grid of sandstone blocks with iron ties connecting them together. It might seem odd to use stone for a chain, given stone's relatively low tensile strength, but Brunelleschi could only use what he had. He didn't have enough iron to completely encircle the dome with an iron chain, and so he took advantage of the fact that stone, while it's somewhat weak in tension, is significantly stronger than brick masonry, which would simply pull apart at the mortar joints between the individual bricks. If you visit Santa Maria del Fiore today, you can actually see the cross ties of the lowest chain projecting from the dome. You can see them right here in this image. 
These seemingly insignificant little knobs, which you might have otherwise overlooked, are actually part of a rich and intriguing story. Now let's look at Brunelleschi's most spectacular achievement, construction of the dome without any temporary centering during the construction phase of the project. The start of construction, building up the dome from successive courses of brick, eh, wouldn't have posed any specific challenge because at that point, the bed of bricks was relatively horizontal. But as the dome grew taller, the working surface inclined progressively farther inward, as you can see here, and eventually it would have been impossible to keep the freshly set bricks from simply sliding off of their bed of wet mortar. To counter this tendency, Brunelleschi devised an incredibly clever herringbone brick pattern to stabilize each course of masonry as it was placed. This photo shows the herringbone pattern viewed from the space between the inner and outer shells of the dome. But how did it actually work? For each course of masonry, the vertical elements of the herringbone pattern actually project above the most recent horizontal layer of bricks. These projections were angled so that the next course of horizontal bricks would be wedged in place and couldn't fall inward. It's really another ingenious structural innovation in this great building. The entire construction process was aided by a series of specialized machines that Brunelleschi designed for lifting and placing all of the various major components of the, of the dome. His use of gears and counterweights and other mechanical contrivances in these machines were far in advance of anything seen previously in the world of construction engineering. We know about these devices today because they were actually sketched by a young apprentice engineer named Leonardo da Vinci, who was actually employed on the construction project for a while. And so these great works of engineering became works of art as well. This was, after all, the Renaissance. In terms of both design and construction, the Dome of Santa Maria del Fiore is the crowning achievement of the Renaissance, and it earned Brunelleschi the reputation he still holds as one of the era's master engineers. His creation remains, even today, the largest brick dome in the world. During this lecture, we've seen three generations of dome buildings responding to progressively greater structural challenges. The Pantheon enclosed a vast circular space with a monolithic concrete hemisphere. Hagia Sophia raised a dome of comparable size to unprecedented height and supported it on just four columns. And Brunelleschi's dome stood so high that temporary centering couldn't be used in its construction. In every one of these cases, challenge bred innovation. And in every case, we saw architectural features that can be attributed directly to, to structural purpose. In the Pantheon, the coffered ceilings and oculus. At Hagia Sophia, the pendentives, the semi-domes and vaults. And in Brunelleschi's dome, that seemingly Gothic profile used for a Renaissance era, era structure. Other features that might previously have seemed mysterious can now be directly attributed to structural purpose. These include those relieving arches on the outer walls of the Pantheon and the visible ends of the stone chains at Brunelleschi's dome. Once again, form follows structure, and seeing structure allows us to understand these buildings in a far more comprehensive and rewarding way. During these past three lectures, we've traced the development of arches, vaults, and domes in the era of empirical design. Next lecture, we'll see how the design of arch structures was affected by the introduction of a fundamentally new structural material, iron, and the advent of scientifically based design methods. Along the way, we'll explore the reasons why great structures just keep on getting greater. Thank you.